a webinar on screen text centers for disease control and prevention preventive medicine grand rounds the findings and conclusions in this presentation are those of the presenters and do not necessarily represent the official position of the centers for disease control and prevention logos cdc and centers for disease control and prevention preventive medicine residency and fellowship good afternoon Welcome to the Preventive Medicine Grand Rounds for June 1st, 2022. I'm Bob Kirkaldi from the Division of Scientific Education and Professional Development. The Preventive Medicine Grand Rounds is sponsored by the CDC Preventive Medicine Residency and Fellowship, or PMRF, and the Health Services, excuse me, Health Resources and Services Administration Bureau of Health Workforce. CDC's PRMF provides 12 and 24 month full-time longitudinal service training opportunities with senior public and population health leaders to physicians, veterinarians, and nurses who completed the EIS program or other equivalent public health experience. We use Zoom for the audio and presentation and the question and answer box to post questions. Note that you can post questions via the question box at any point during the lectures and the speakers will answer questions following their presentations. Note your name may appear associated with the question that you posed if you don't want your name to be associated with a question, please select Submit Anonymously. We have two speakers today. Um, and um, so uh, please, when submitting a question, please note whether it's directed toward the first or second speaker, although that's been less of an issue uh, recently. Um, continuing education credits are available for the live course up to one month after today's presentation date and for the recorded version up to two years from the date of presentation through the CDC Training and Educate, excuse me, Training and Continuing Education or TCE online portal. The course code for this grand rounds is all capital letters CDC PMRF. If you have any questions, please consult the Preventive Medicine Grand Rounds website. Please remember that the views presented by the speakers today are theirs alone and do not represent CDC, the Department of Health and Human Services, or the U.S. government. We have two speakers for today's Grand Rounds. The first speaker is Dr. Esther Kukielka, and her talk is titled Pan American Health Organization or PAHO's Role in Public Health Emergencies. Following her talk, we'll take several minutes for our speaker to answer questions from the audience that we received via the question and answer. So please welcome our first speaker, Dr. Kukiaka. The Pan American Health Organization's Open Brace Paho Close Brace Role in Public Health Emergencies. Esther Kukielka Open Brace She Slash Her Close Brace PhD, DBM, MSC, CDC Preventive Medicine Fellow. Grant Rounds, May 2022. Locos, Paho Pan American Health Organization, World Health Organization. Headshot of Esther. Hey, thank you, Bob. So I just want to add uh, that I have no disclosures to report and the content of this presentation reflects my opinion and does not necessarily reflect the official position of neither the CDC or PAHO. Overview. And I will open this talk by giving a presentation on the International Health Regulations or IHR, which is a lengthy document that covers many different areas and procedures. In this presentation, I am going to, to be a little bit, to give a little bit simplistic overview of the present, um, to, sorry, <laughs> to the present um, yeah, 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 EHR 2005 uh, version. And specifically, I'm going to focus on the work that, that my team within PAHO does uh, within the IHR section, which is the surveillance notification and risk assessment part of it. Next, I will discuss the work uh, we do at the IHM team, and that is the emergency information and risk assessment team within PAHO and how we help implementing the IHR in our everyday work. And I will finish with a couple of examples of the work I've done with the team to provide technical support to some of the countries in the region of the Americas. The IHR is a legally binding agreement signed by 196 countries that focuses on collaboration to detect and report potential public health emergencies of international concern. 
Its history goes back to the 19th century, when the only rules that countries had in place to avoid disease spread across countries were um, some types of quarantines in major ports and harbors. There were really no common rules for all, and each of them would set their own rules. In the first quarter of the 19th century, a series of cholera outbreaks hit Asia, the Middle East, and Europe, and the use of um, stem boats and the opening of the Suez Canal made international trade and travel faster and more feasible. So cholera expanded also to the Americas and it became clear that some type of international regulations to control disease spread were needed. In, 19, in 1851, the first international sanitary conference took place in Paris. During this and during a series of other conferences throughout the following century, so it went really slow, the emerging uh, public health community standardized international quarantine regulations against the spread of three main diseases, cholera, and this was where most of the emphasis was put on, plague, and also yellow fever. WHO was finally created almost a century after this first conference in 1948, and the first official IHR were set three years later in 1951 under the name of International Sanitary Regulations. And the name of IHR was only coined in 1969. Since then, several modifications have shaped the IHR to its current form of this version, 2005. And just last week, the World Health Assembly accepted some changes proposed to modify this version, and they are expected to be implemented within the next two years. So as you see, these regulations are an evolving document that tries to adapt and learn from what is currently needed. Cover of the document, International Health Regulations Open Brace 2005 Close Brace 3rd Edition, World Health Organization. So as I mentioned earlier, the IHR are a set of international regulations that were created to balance public health security and national traffic and trade, while at the same time respecting economic activities. This means that we are going to, uh, we're trying to reduce any potential international spread of public health emergency of international concern while reducing as much as possible obstruction of international traffic. And indeed, I, I was, uh, when I was preparing for this presentation, I was surprised as per how much of the IHR document discusses traffic and traveler, of travelers and also trade of goods. To achieve this, the IHR serves as a global alert and response system um, or as a facilitator for surveillance, risk assessment, alert and coordination across, across countries and across sectors. And this intersectoriality is crucial when protecting population health. So we now live in an interconnected world and globalization is a fact. And as I would like to think borders are just a legacy of our ancestors and really diseases don't know anything about borders. So if a country doesn't have the resources or capability to carry out uh, these actions here, a disease is not going to stop at its borders. And that is why we have the IHR4, and that is why we say that we are as strong as the weakest link in the chain. The IHR must be based on scientific evidence and it covers all hazards like infectious diseases, chemical, radionuclear, bioterrorism events. Although in the past, the IHR would only cover a handful of infectious diseases, as I mentioned before, um, through several revisions in the current 2005 version, this was modified to include those other types of public health events of international spread. So for example, one of the potential public health events that we are keeping an eye on these days is that of the potential, potential shortage of yellow fever vaccines for win the Russian conflict. The vaccine for yellow fever has a very slow and tedious manufacturing process, and there are not that many suppliers around the world, with Russia being one of the largest. So due to the current conflict, there are concerns of vaccine shortage for the upcoming months if, an, if a large outbreak of yellow fever occurs. So the network of countries that abide to the IHR are in constant communication now to try to mitigate the effects of this war 
on potential vaccine supply shortages. So for example, PAHO has already released recommendations on the management of vaccine reserve stockpiles in the region. One of the other interesting changes that were introduced in the current version is that of event-based surveillance or EBS as a tool of early warning system. In the past, the only accepted way to collect information and to carry out surveillance was through official sources. But the WHO recognized that there was a need to also monitor an official resources like the media, blogs, Twitter posts, so we could detect unusual events way faster than waiting for an official report to come out. So if WHO or one of the regions detect an important signal, they may contact the specific country where that signal is coming from for clarification or verification of this signal. For example, we, throughout COVID, we have been monitoring which countries have been detecting which variants of COVID. So imagine when we were working with Omicron, most of the times we would receive news coming from the country telling us, hey, we just discovered the Omicron, the Omicron um, variant in our country. Uh, I just want you to know so, so we understand what the, what the situation is. Uh, but sometimes we, we found these notifications first through the media. So if that happens, what we would do, we would contact the country and say, hey, we found this in, in the media, in this newsletter, in this newspaper, in this blog post. Is this real? Is this something that needs verification? Is this not real at all? And like that, we can have that communication open and having that a little bit faster than, than having to wait for those official reports. So to comply with the IHR, both countries and also the WHO and, and the regions have agreed to follow a series of commitments. And here we're going to have a really small summary of those. Again, as I mentioned, this is a lengthy document with a lot of different specifications. This, is, this talk is only a summary of, of, of what the intent of the IHR. A table with two columns state parties on the left and WHO on the right. So both parties agree to be in constant 24-7 communication for any emergency that arises. And for this, each country has a specific team member that is called the National Focal Point or NFP that is in charge of maintaining this type of communication. And the, I, the WHO and the regions, they also have a similar counterpart. This communication can happen through emails, specialized secure information platforms that are secured, like the event information site. We also have uh, disease outbreak news that are open with the, to the public, and we have other methods of communications. WHO and the regions carry out risk assessments of potential risk to constantly assess the risk of local, regional, and global spread throughout time. And another big commitment that we have on the table is that of WHO and the regions to help countries develop core capacities that in turn will allow countries to be able to have appropriate surveillance systems in place, as well as prevention and response capacities. And the work examples that I'm going to provide at the end of this talk are on those lines. We help providing technical support and we also help surveillance through a couple of projects. This helps strengthening countries' abilities to control diseases that cross borders at ports, ground crossings, and airports, so water, land, and air. Once those are established, notification and reporting of any public health emergency of international spread will be easier to carry out. To finish this slide, I want to say that um, the WHO and the regions have developed a series of tools to help monitoring and evaluating countries' capacity to comply with these commitments. And those are, we have the mandatory states party self-assessment, which is an annual reporting that as the name mentions is compulsory. And then we have three others that are voluntary. One is the joint external evaluation or JAE, then we have the simulation exercises and after action reviews or interaction reviews as well. The commitments of the state parties include develop, strengthen, and maintain surveillance, prevention and response capacities, notification and reporting. The commitment of the WHO include collect and assess information on potential risks, help developing core capacities, control diseases at ports, ground crossings, and at airports monitor and evaluate the level of core capacity, 
both commit to communication. So my team, the HIM team, focuses on the surveillance, notification, and risk assessment part of the IHR. And I want to present you, um, again, simplify example of how we do this. State parties and WHO in columns again. I'm going to use an imaginary disease, but this is how it would work, say, for the acute severe hepatitis outbreak we started seeing a few weeks ago, or with diseases such as monkeypox. A small green circle and the word surveillance in the state parties column. So imagine this thing here, it looks kind of like a planet, but imagine it is a country. I didn't want to use the shape of any specific country. But imagine that we have this country here doing the regular surveillance, and they realize that they start having some cases in different parts within the country of disease X, which is a really bad disease that you don't want to have in your country because it, it can kill a lot of people very fast and it spreads very fast. And you can imagine whichever disease you want to think about. You can think about COVID. You can think about any other disease, Ebola, um, any other disease that you can think about. I'm going to talk about disease X. So once uh, the country realizes that they're having these cases, they think, OK, uh, this is a really bad disease. We know that. Is this something that we need to report through the IHR mechanism? Like, do we need to notify the other countries and WHO and the regions about this, this problem, about this disease? And for that, we have the Annex 2 of the IHR regulation, uh, which is a, a, a tool that we can use to decide if we really need to start that communication process or not. So it, it's kind of an algorithm that you are answering with your specific situation, yes or no. And at the end, it helps you decide, OK, this is something that we really should be notifying or not. So say that we the Annex 2, a flow chart based on answers to yes or no questions. Then. On the table, arrows representing notification to other countries in the state parties column and across to the WHO column. We need to notify this disease. What we're going to do, we're going to send a few emails. Uh, we're going to send an email uh, for sure to the regional office. For example, if we're talking of a country within the American region, we're going to receive an email in PAHO uh, telling us about this disease X. And they're going to give us a lot of um, information. For example, where did they found it? When did they found it? the clinical symptoms that the person is going through and things like that. But also some other countries might also be notified. Uh, let's say, so I'm, I grew up in Spain. So let's say that um, I'm in Spain visiting my family, which is something that hopefully will happen soon. Um, and I come back to the States. And uh, three days later, I start showing signs of disease X. I go to the doctor. The doctor reports this to the national authorities. They realize it's, again, bad disease. They need to notify it, and when they send an email to, to PAHO, to the region, and to other countries, they also want to be sure that they send an email to Spain. That's the country where I was coming from, because just three days later, I started developing these symptoms. So they say, hey, Spain, we just got this person that came back from visiting your country, from visiting Spain three days ago with this disease, and we just want to know, we just want to let you know that maybe this person contracted the disease in your country, and maybe you want to increase surveillance there um, because it could be that the disease is circulating in your population, and maybe you know it or you don't know it. So just as a warning system, keep your eyes open, something might be happening. Um, imagine, for example, that instead of talking of an infectious disease, uh, now from the, the last version of the IHR in 2005, we're also notifying other diseases as well, uh, other events. So imagine that we have a chemical spill that happened in the water in the ocean. So this country here is going to contact all the other countries that might be affected like through that contamination in the water. OK, so this, this will depend depending on the public health event that we are um, talking about. But this is more or less how it will work in a very simplified way. Communication is going to keep going back and forth from countries and the regions. And also the role, I, as I mentioned earlier, from WHO and, and the regions, from PAHO, for example, would be to provide recommendations, to provide capacity, and to constantly be doing risk assessments to see how the event is progressing throughout time. Um, so for example, we were talking about this monkeypox that is just happening right now. Um, so WHO and the regions have provided guidelines on surveillance, on case investigation, contact tracing, laboratory recommendations, and things like that. 
Now, to be able to provide appropriate assistance in each circumstance, it is very important to have country-specific knowledge on cultural and situational awareness. So this is something we need to take into account every time that we're working with any country or, or any group of people, really. And I encounter a very good example of this a bit before I started working with PAHO. And um, at the end of February last year, when COVID-19 cases in Papua New Guinea were raising, the founder and former prime minister, Mr. Somare, passed away. It is the culture of the people in Papua New Guinea to celebrate and gather together after the passing of a loving one to express the collective love the people had for the deceased. And this is called house cry. So the death of Mr. Somare became a collective event in which the entire nation had to and wanted to participate. He was very loved for the community. So it was impossible to separate public health measures such as mobility restrictions or limiting the number of people in gatherings from the country's burial customs, making it clear that public health advice must take those into consideration. And while always based in science, we also need to consider the cultural context of our population. This is a reminder that the purpose of the IHR within this context and this example that I just gave you is to have surveillance, assessment, and alert and coordination. That's why we have the IHR. AHIM's COVID-19 logic model infographic. Drawing of a van traveling on a road. It passes different sections including inputs, activities, outputs, and outcomes. Then, moderators. Now, because I have been working with IHM during the last year, most of the work I have been involved with has been COVID-19. Here you have a logic model of the work we do regarding COVID, but the structure also holds when we are dealing with other public health events of concern. And the IHIM team conducts a daily epidemic intelligence surveillance of the COVID-19 cases, hospitalizations, and deaths in the region. So we collect all this data from each of the countries, then we produ produce epicures, we produce map mapping maps, we produce situational awareness, awareness of the region, of COVID-19 in the region. Uh, for this, we have these inputs here that are the resources needed to implement the activities that we're gonna do. Here you have the activities that the program and the staff do with those resources, those inputs. Here, here we have the outputs, which are gonna be the tangible, oh, sorry. They're gonna be the, perfect, sorry about it. They're gonna be the tangible products uh, that, we are, that we are creating. Um, and here for, for COVID-19, we have some specific for COVID, but again, some of these are gonna be generous, generally savable for, um, for other diseases as well. Here we have the moderators that are contextual factors that are out of the control of the program of, or our team, but that can help or hinder achievement of our outcomes. And now here we are gonna have the, change, the outcomes that are the changes that we want to see happen uh, because of our activities and our outputs. Outcomes. What will change because of these efforts? Short term. Describe the burden of disease in the region. Monitor trends and patterns of disease. Midterm. Identify risk factors of disease. Detect changes in disease occurrence and distribution in a timely manner. Long term. Provide data to programs and policies. Allow evaluation of prevention and control strategies that can save lives. And Ultimately, what we want to do is we want to provide enough good quality information to other programs and policies so prevention and control measures can be based, based on the best science. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit of uh, three different examples of work that I've done uh, with the team. To start with, I'll talk about this uh, project that or, or assistance that we provided um, with, to Trinidad Tobago. Trinidad and Tobago reached out to PAHO at the beginning of August last year to request technical support. And we started a five month long collaboration where we met weekly, mainly to discuss how the public health and social mes measures or PHSM that the country had implemented impacted COVID-19 cases, hospitalizations and deaths. 
we carry out a literature search on what types of PHSM worked in other countries. We made use of Google mobility data to understand the impact of mobility restrictions on cases and deaths. We use statistical modeling to predict increases or decreases in number of cases and deaths as well. Statistical modeling including ARIMA, cross-correlation, COMO model, COVID-SIM. We also provide the support on the interpretation and calculation of time-varying reproduction numbers and discuss other topics such as excess mortality, the use of SPSS for running some of the analysis we discussed, and the importance of understanding the local culture to make sense of the numbers and context. This work assisted our country partner, the technical director of epidemiology, Dr. Heinz, with using evidence-based science in communications with the public, the media, and the Ministry of Health, directly influencing um, policy decisions. Another project we have been working on focuses on the impact of the COVID-19 in healthcare workers in the region of the Americas. As you well know, um, healthcare workers around the globe have been on the front lines fighting the COVID-19 pandemic, and they have been exposed to high levels of stress, exhaustion, and the psychological burden of seeing friends, colleagues, and patients dying daily to COVID-19. So for this work, um, we are going to be working with the Net Network, which is a network of hospitals, laboratories, and associated organizations that work as a sentinel partners for severe acute respiratory infections in the Americas. We have prepared an online questionnaire to collect information on healthcare workers regarding sociodemographic factors, type of work, employment status, quality of care, infection prevention and control, COVID-19 vaccination status, and impact of COVID-19 on their mental health. Our main objective here is to produce scientific evidence that will ultimately lead to an improvement of practices to protect healthcare workers. Images of three addendum documents. Considerations for Conducting Rapid Community Assessment in Tribal Communities, November 2021. Considerations for Conducting Rapid Community Assessment in Adolescent Populations and Digital Contexts, November 2021. Considerations for Conducting Rapid Community Assessment in Migrant and Seasonal Farmworker Communities, January 2022. The last of the examples I am going to be talking about, it's a rapid community assessment or RCA we are putting together with CDC and the Ministry of Health in Dominica. An RCA is a process that we use to collect community insights and thoughts about a specific public health issue. In our case, it's gonna be COVID vaccines in order to inform program design. The RCA involves reviewing existing data conducting community-based interviews, listening sessions, observations, social listening, and surveys. And it is carried out in a short period of time to get a snapshot of the current community perspective on the matter. This specific RCA will serve as a pilot to better understand the reasons behind the relatively low COVID-19 vaccine acceptance and uptake in the healthcare worker in the Caribbean. And the results will help identifying activities that could be used to increase vaccine acceptance among healthcare workers in Dominica. So with that, I wanna thank you all and I'm happy to answer any questions. Ikukilka at cdc.gov. Thank you, Esther. Thank you for a fantastic presentation. Um, so I will, as we, as um, looks like there are questions coming in through the question and answer box. So I'd invite you all is to um, pose your questions through there. Um, but I will kick it off with a question of my own which is, um, are there, as from your experience, are there any limitations um, or criticisms of the IHR um, as you're, from your perspective? Mm -hmm. Thanks. So actually, there are, there, there always are, I think, <laughs> with, with anything. And um, I think that the 
changes that are that have been proposed and accepted last week are definitely tackling some of those and this just happened last week um but one of the things that that we need to think about is that being part of this network it's uh, voluntary and even though we have these commitments that that i talked about if you don't follow those commitments you don't have any repercussion nothing's going to happen to you uh so basically that there are no penalizations if the rules are not followed so the the changes that are just happening now that, that again just happened last week and i'm still catching up uh on on what's what's gonna change here um but one of the changes that i've seen is that there's gonna be a compliance committee um to be sure that countries are doing what they have to do uh, and that we are following the IHR um, regulations. So there's going to be a little bit more. Um, someone's big what is going to be watching that a bit a bit closer. Um, then also another of the of the limitations that we have or, or the criticisms is that many countries are not able to develop, strengthen, and maintain really this surveillance and response capacity. Um, not, not everyone has the same resources in money, in, in people, in experts already working in those countries. Um, and I think that one of the ways that the new regulations are going to try to tackle this is like where the the, IHA, the WHO is going to start gathering money from the WHO members. So we're going to be having more monetary resources to be able to implement and to help um, with this uh, capacitation, let's say. Uh, then something that I I think it's a big problem and, and we have the same issue in the veterinary field. I'm, I'm a veterinarian by training. And when we have these systems for reporting information and to increase communication, like there's a disease happening, everyone wants to know about it so we can protect ourselves. Um, a lot of times, many countries, uh, they don't want to report that they have a specific disease because they fear economic consequences on tourism and also in trade. Like, as to give an example, what we know from COVID, because we all know what's happening, we have COVID, but in the veterinary field, that is that I worked for, for, for a long time, is called African swine fever, and they call it the Ebola of the pigs because they, they bleed to death and there's no treatment, there's no vaccine. And African swine fever has been spreading a lot through a lot of different countries. And a lot of times you see like the official maps between two countries, you have a lot of cases in the border but in uh, this country is reporting, but this country here is not reporting anything. And you see plenty of cases here in the border. So obviously, countries are not reporting as much as they should because they fear those consequences. And that's a problem that I think is quite difficult to, to tackle. So I, I will stop there. There are, there are a few more, but, but I don't want to. I talk a lot sometimes, so I'll stop there. Okay, thank you. Um, the um, first question from the audience, I don't remember what is on slide seven, but I think I believe the question, the slide seven may have been about balancing of public health and trade or economic um, health. Um, they posed the question, or maybe you can speak to it, is the issue of protection of personal privacy. Um, and they pose, um, you know, is this an issue uh, that should be included in slide seven? And, the, or, and perhaps extending that, how is, um, uh, personal privacy and, um, and data protected with the transmission of, of um, data among the different partners. Yeah, so personal privacy, not like to identify yourself. Uh, there's no, no names, there are no names exchanged. And, and, and I, I think I'm, I'm correct. Again, this is not the official position of WHO, oh, sorry, of PACO or, or CDC. And I might be wrong, but there's, uh, I've never seen names and last names or addresses anything that would be able to identify you it will be there has been a case of disease x in an elderly patient that is 95 years old um, uh, that it's a female and these are the clinical signs um, they could say it the case was in this region of the country so we also have an idea of the spatial distribution of the disease which is something super important to understand how the disease is moving or or how this disease is being introduced in a country. But regarding personal protection, like there will be no way that we can actually identify you directly. That information, the country itself may have it, but that is information that, that they are uh, not gonna be distributing. A lot of times when um, public health um, investigations
investigations are being carried out. Uh, I might be doing some interviews to people and I might be collecting personal information, but then I don't share that information with, let's say, anyone outside my team. And even within my team, many people won't even know the name of that person. There is a way what, that we do when we are working with data. Uh, we kind of mask those names and we, for example, give them a number instead of a name and a last name, we give them a random number that has been generated by Amazon. So it's only like one person we have the names and that will be immediately translated to a code and no one will know about name, uh, last names, specific uh, addresses or things like that. So personal information, I don't think that is an issue, but your question makes me think about something that it's a bit tricky and we might get the question or not, but this is something that I'm thinking about with the international health regulations, because we are regulating uh, traveling, not only of, like trade of goods, but also traveling from people. There, there have been questions about, um, about human rights, like being in French or not. Like, can you tell me that I need to be here and quarantine in, in, the, in this room in the airport or in a hotel next to the airport for three weeks? Because you're, are you infringing my human rights of, of being free and being able to walk around? Um, and the other side is like, well, you're going to be there for three weeks. We're going to be monitoring you. But then we're sure that we are protecting the whole population so the disease is not being spread. So that is something that is really tricky. Um, I don't have the answer. And I know that there, there are a lot of uh, legal implications and a lot of people working on these topics to see how we can have a balance between that personal protection, like more human right base, and still protecting the whole population. Thank you, thank you. Oh, we are getting a few questions in. Um, first question, uh, and that's sort of the next question is, um, do any of the PAHO countries use electronic health record data or health information exchange data to share data electronically? Um, it, it says specifically with CDC, but I'll think of other, you know, perhaps with other state, um, uh, other countries that are party to PAHO or to PAHO itself um, to exchange electronic data in real time, um, for, such as for COVID variants. Yeah, so for for my awareness, uh, we are not using, but I might be wrong, but I don't think we are using electronic medical records directly from the countries because we in PAHO, we are in contract with the countries through that national focal point. So that person is the one who's gonna be like talking to us, sending us the information that they think is appropriate. So we are not like pulling directly from a national record of, 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 of medical records. Um, uh, regarding the variants, uh, there is uh, this platform right now, GSA, that it was previously used a lot with uh, and still used for, for influenza, but when COVID came in, uh, they, they opened like a, a section for COVID as well. And now what a lot of countries are doing is like, as soon as they have uh, a variant in their country and they have, they have it sequenced and they have the sequence, they can upload it to GSA. And we like it, it's an open community worldwide, and everyone can can have access to that specific sequence. So if you're like there are researchers at the university, like working trying to understand the variances and and the uh, and the mutations that are happening, they can go to that to that website and download that data, and it will be as real time as uh, the country can do it. Like whenever they have this, that sequence, they can upload it. Uh, again, this is uh, something that is voluntary, but we've seen, spe especially through this uh, COVID pandemic, that it's very important to share this type of information because again, borders are something that, I mean, are important nowadays, of course, for passports and visas and, and, and rights. In one country is not the same as the other, but really diseases, they, they don't see that. They don't understand of those. So it's very important that we all are sharing um, the information whenever we have it, because the, the more information, right, <laughs> correct information is out there, the better we can work together to try to fight all these type of, of pandemics and, and public health issues. Thank you. Um, next question is, uh, you presented this as primarily a government activity. Um, they pose, what role should NGOs play? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so very good point, because right now the NGOs are not that well represented in the IHR, but with the new IHR, uh, they are NGOs mentioned several times in the proposed and accepted uh, IHR. So if you want, I'm going to look for the, for the, 
the new um, proposed and, and accepted uh, IHR regulation, like the changes, and I can post it in the chat later. Uh, so you can look at those, but definitely it is being more and more recognized that we need the help of NGOs and not only NGOs, but even the public. The, the help from the public is also going to be stated there in the IHR, because again, we are all in this together and we definitely need everyone's help. Thank you for that question. Um, I guess one of the, and the next question is for, I think I may know where, um, how you'll answer it, but I'm curious about this too. Um, so during the surveillance of disease, you talked about reaching out to the country of origin. I believe it was disease X, um, reaching out to the country of origin about an outbreak that's now a threat to the community, for okay. example. Are, is that country, I guess that you reached back out to the country of origin, are they mandated to do anything to stop the spread of the disease? So again, these are recommendations. We, we are not really talking about a mandate that if you don't do it, you're gonna have these repercussions, but definitely they should. And it's in their own interest to stop the spread of disease. You don't wanna have, if you are like, I don't know, the ruler, or, or if you are in charge of, of the health of, of your population and you know that this disease X, which is really bad, is gonna spread, you want to do something for your people, for sure. Uh, so definitely you should try to do everything in, in your power uh, to, to stop that spread. And, and if you don't have that many things that you can do or you don't know what to do because you're overwhelmed or you don't have the resources, that's why the regions and WHO are there to try to help with whatever we can. Thank you. So it sounds, it sounds like that the, it's a mechanism for sharing information with the country. The country takes that information, decides what they'll do um, and what they are able to do, and then also can reach out to WHO or other partners for guidance or advice or help if they if they so desire. Yeah, definitely. Um, let's see. This um, there is one question. I'm not sure. It seems to look at, it may be out of scope of your talk, but if you um, perhaps if you could speak to it, if you're able to. Um, are there, um, or I guess, what is the, are there um, uh, frameworks set up that allow organizations like PAHO and like WHO more broadly to function independently? And I guess the ask question, the ask, um, audience members asking independently and perhaps that, I'm not sure exactly what they mean, but perhaps sort of, you know, free of um, undue influence or, um, I'm not entirely sure, but, you know, I, I think it's a question of maybe how does, um, how are, how are um, entities like WHO, um, PAHO, you know, how do those, maybe how do they choose their priorities and how are they able to function independently? Yeah, yeah, so uh, it might be a bit out of the scope, and I, I can say a little bit about it. Um, we have return to the HIMSS COVID-19 logic model. These moderators here that I mentioned, and we have political, economic, social, and technological moderators that, that we put in here, but I'm sure we have many others. Um, I think that many times we have limitations, like coming from many different ways. We cannot always do what we want. And also we are not, even though we are, we are a whole organization, and we have we have the director general here in PAHO. We have a, our our own director for for the PAHO for the American region. Uh, the decisions are not taken by one person only. They are taken as a team, and we have they are they are consulting all the different experts in all the different matters. Uh, and and it's taking the decisions are yeah are are taken as a whole, um, always with the last word. Uh, on the on the mouth of the director but we live in a society where you need to take into consideration all the restrictions that you have um so for example i was saying i would love to stop diseases by imagine um if i see someone that has the disease i'm gonna put a balloon around them and they're gonna they're not gonna be able to spread it and anywhere 
But I cannot really do that because I need to think about the life of this person. They have a family. They are like an individual person. They might have a super important role in the NGO they are working on. And I cannot just like abstract them from society. So we need to work in balance, thinking of all the pros and cons, on, and cons of all the decisions that we are making. And that's why at the beginning here, when I was talking about, um, about the IHR, I was saying that we are trying to respect those economic activities, but also like having that balance between public health and trying to obstruct as little as possible uh, the trade of people and goods. Uh, so it really it's a balance and it's, it's very difficult to know, like if you put a little bit more of salt here or a little bit more of pepper here, if the, the final outcome is going to be what we are all looking for. Thank you. Yeah, and, and and to follow on that, speaking to a previous question and your comment, you know, also balancing the human rights um, and, you know, and privacy issues as well. Mm -hmm. um, so definitely complicated balance. Sure. Um, okay, well, thank you so much for a wonderful talk. Thank you. We will turn, we will turn now to our next speaker. So our um, second presenter as we give our speakers a chance to change their slides. Um, our second presenter is Lieutenant Commander uh, Howard Chio, and his talk, as you will soon see, is uh, entitled Designing Infodemic Surveillance Systems for Public Health. There we go. Looks great. Um, so please welcome our uh, presenter, and I will now turn it over to you. Thank you, Howard. Center for Disease Control and Prevention, Center for Global Health. Designing Infodemic Surveillance Systems for Public Health. LCDR Howard Chio, MD, PhD. CDC Preventive Medicine Resident. Demand for Immunization Team, Immunization Systems Branch. Global Immunizations Division Center for Global Health. No, thank you so much, Bob. Uh, good afternoon, good morning, and good evening, and thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm going to be talking today about designing infodemic surveillance systems for public health. And I want to start um, with what I think is something that I think is intuitive to everyone now, that vaccine misinformation and disinformation has really spread at astonishing rates. So one of the things that I was surprised to learn is that in the United States, 78% uh, of people, the vast majority of people in the U.S., believe or are, are, are unsure of at least one falsehood about COVID-19 or the vaccine. If you look to the right, there's a list of some of these falsehoods. These include things like the government is exaggerating the number of COVID-19 deaths, but also things like the vaccines cause infertility, ivermectin is a safe and effective treatment, things that we have uh, probably heard of before. 32%, almost a third, believe or were unsure of at least four falsehoods. And this is data from October 2021 via the Kaiser Family Foundation. This is nearly two years into the pandemic. So for me, this is really striking. And one of the key questions that I have that I think is worthwhile thinking about is how might we build public health surveillance systems for these kind of infodemics? What I'd like to do today is is start with, um, with with three things. Objectives. The first is to talk a little bit about what are infodemics so that we can have a common language and be on the same page. The second is to talk a little bit about the CDC State of Vaccine Confidence Insights Reporting System, and this will serve as a good example for what a infodemic surveillance system might look like. And then take those considerations and then translate them into, uh, into an outline for what we might think about when we're designing uh, infodemic surveillance systems de novo or from scratch. So let me start with what an infodemic is. And when we say into infodemic, uh, in the same way that an epidemic is, uh, is, is, is a disease that exists in a population at a higher rate than expected, same thing with infodemics, except that instead of diseases, we're talking about information. When there's an excess of information within the system, we can then call that an, an, an infodemic. When we talk about this overabundance of information, we think about both accurate as well as inaccurate information. So with an accurate information, we might be thinking about facts. We might be thinking about rumors that kind of occupy this line. They might be accurate and might not be um, accurate. But also things like conspiracy theories, misinformation, which are accidental falsehoods, and disinformation, which are deliberate falsehoods. 
frequently we also talk about this notion of an infodemic void. So in a system, if there is not really enough information out there, there might be some accurate, some inaccurate information, some other inaccurate things out there. It becomes very easy for the system to then become overwhelmed with inaccurate information, with disinformation, with rumors. On the flip side, at an individual level, we sometimes talk about an information overload, where for an a, in, for a individual, there's too much information, whether accurate or, mis or, 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 uh, or accurate, it can then become psychologically overwhelming, such that it becomes very easy for this information, misinformation, inaccurate information to then come in and, and overwhelm that individual. I also want to remind people when we talk about infodemics, we usually think about things online, but the information ecosystem includes things like traditional television media or traditional print media and offline conversations as well. And we've now have some really interesting examples of pamphlets or other things that were uh, spread in communities that spread mis and disinformation. For me, it's really important to recognize that infodemics contribute to a lot of different things uh, in terms of impacts, right? Like I, I, I think now and again for this audience, we, we feel that um, infodemics and we have examples that infodemics contribute to vaccine hesitancy, but also things like decreased adherence to public health guidance, promotion of false treatments, which then can lead to drug shortages, eroded trust in institutions and government, as well as loss, loss of social cohesion, you know, stigma, threats against public health workers. We now have examples of all of these. So there's a very strong sense that infodemics have some clinical significance for public health. So let's move towards the uh, CDC State of Vaccine Confidence Insights Reporting System. I and mean, I'm super excited to share this with you, but I do want to make very clear that this section is not work that I have done, nor is it work that my team is currently doing, although members of my team have definitely contributed in the past. This is work that um, is currently being led by Chris Vogelai and NCIRD and others in ISB. And the history of the system is that it came out in early 2021 that there was a need for a better way of better understanding Americans in terms of the disinformation and information and things that people were saying. So a new solution really needed to be created from scratch. So just to put you in the mindset, if you were a public health authority during that time period, you might have questions about how are Americans responding to news of the Omicron variant, or if you're a parent, you know, what kind of questions do parents have about COVID vaccinations in kids, right? So, so we wanted to make sure that there was some system for inputs into the public health system so that we can capture some of those questions and perspectives and conversations that were happening out in the wild. In terms of the data sources for this reporting system, so one key cornerstone of this is both social listening and media monitoring. So not just social media sources, but also uh, traditional media monitoring that was coming into this, uh, this large data source. Looking at third party reports, which are often uh, reports of extractions also from, um, from social listening and media monitoring sources that were coming in, but with a bit of analysis and additional layers on top of that. Direct reports from CDC, so that includes media requests, web metrics, looking at CDC info, which is our public inquiry system at, um, at the CDC, and then looking at research. So both in terms of primary research and the scientific literature, but also looking at polling data coming from Gallup, Kaiser, Pew Research, um, and others. So all of this um, gets pulled into um, into this, this analysis system. And what I want to highlight here is that there's a lot happening here, but the general idea is that all of the data comes in. Uh, State of vaccine confidence report process, an infographic timeline, tasks along week one through week two. Themes are extracted, and then an integrated analysis is done, where we look for both consistencies across multiple data sources, as well as inconsistencies and potential gaps that might be there. All of those themes are then extracted out and then, um, and then uh, put into a review process. Each theme is then classified by risk. So classified as high, medium, low, or a positive sentiment, but also classified by directionality. So the, uh, looking at to see whether the theme or the idea has changed over time, whether it's increasing, decreasing, or it's stable. These are then collated into uh, reports that not just have concrete examples and descriptions of each theme, but then also uh, potential interventions. So if you look at uh, the example to my left, on the very bottom, there's a ways to act section uh, for a audience of people who are potentially designing interventions with some starter ideas of how you might want to respond to the potential theme that has been identified. 
These are then pulled into these um, state of conf uh, vaccine confidence inside reports. These are publicly accessible. Um, so if someone can drop the link to the chat, that'd be great. If not, if you Google uh, CDC state of vaccine confidence inside reports, you can actually see some examples of, uh, of, of what these reports look like. Some evaluation has been done to get a sense of how we readers are using these reports. So we know that readers have been using them to inform communication strategies, to inform personal understandings of what the like very large and complex vaccine confidence issues there are out there, to inform the development of partnerships to design interventions and, and address the issues that are, are highlighted, to better understand vaccine hesitancy and access challenges for special populations of interest. And I know that the team has often been running uh, special reports for special populations um, on request. And then also to provide a way of prioritizing vaccine confidence issues. Without this system, it can often be overwhelming to look at the media and hear of X, Y, and Z that is currently uh, under discussion. So having a sense of, of both acuity as well as the rate allows for users to really prioritize and think strategically about which issues might be higher priority than others. I want to highlight a few unique attributes to this system that I hope is a little bit intuitive. So the first is that hopefully you have a sense that this is incredibly labor intensive, but it's also very multi interdisciplinary or multidisciplinary. It requires collaboration between people of not just epidemiologists, but also social scientists, communication folks, marketers. It really requires people to work across disciplines to make the system work. The other attribute is that public reports are at the national level. And again, special reports can be generated, but generally the, the, the regular reports are, are put out for the entire country. And this um, is important for getting a sense of the nation, but sometimes users who are designing interventions work at a different level, right? You might be working at a state or local health department. Um, so it's important to recognize that, that even though the reports are at the national level, these uh, national level reports may or may not reflect the conversations that are happening for your specific community for which you have an intervention frame to do something about. The third is that a subjective lens is required. And I want to highlight that this is not necessarily a limitation, right? Part of the power of this process is that human analysts are really required because statistical programs can't do this kind of work, right? We have AI, AI algorithms that can do some basic sentiment analysis, but you really need to look at not just the contents, but, but put it into context to better understand the, 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 the situation. And every time I talk about qualitative or quantitative data, it becomes um, worthwhile mentioning this comic strip that I deeply love. Right here's this individual saying, let's get a show of hands. Who here prefers quantitative data over qualitative data? One, two, three, looks like oh, hi, everybody, 100%. Tell me, why do you prefer quant? Well, quant data is the only way to really know. Oh, sorry, I should have mentioned, please only use numbers in your response. So again, I think traditionally in public health, we view quantitative um, as, as, as the gold standard, we, we are always a little bit skeptical of qualitative systems, but I think the SLVC is actually a really important example of the power of combining a quantitative with a qualitative lens so that you can not just get a sense of scope and, um, and the overall population rate, but also understand the context and the contents of, 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 of what is happening. For this kind of system, using both is actually critical. The final point that I have here is that public discourse may change faster than report speed, right? You, you've got in a sense that putting together these reports is a complex work that requires many data sources, right? So by the time you've completed the analysis, put things through clearance, the public changes very fast, right? Especially in this kind of um, hyper-acute modern information age environment. So the by the time the report comes out, there is a lag in time. And then uh, there's always this concern that the discourse might not have caught up to by the time that the, um, that the report has, uh, has been published. So we've talked about what are infodemics. I've, I've provided a little bit of an example of the state of vaccine confidence insights reporting system. Let's move on to talk about some key considerations for designing infodemic surveillance systems. And when we sat down to really reflect on the experience of the SOVC system, we came together and, and highlighted kind of four or five key themes, key functions that we imagine the future of infodemic surveillance systems might look like. The first is to monitor the information environment by person, place, and time. This I think is pretty um, intuitive. 
but also to use digital media analytics to identify infodemic events, right? That, that the whole point of the system is, is to not just get a sense of the environment, but have potential triggers for events or situations that might require a response. On the flip side of this, we think it's equally important to make sure that offline community assessments are, in, are included. And I often think it's important to remind, remind people that a very large percentage, 15% of people in the US, don't actually own a smartphone. And increasingly, more and more public conversations are uh, taking place on dark social. This is a social media uh, term. It is not my term. But dark social refers to, uh, to media environments that is harder to extract data out of, right? So like uh, text messages, emails, private message groups like over WhatsApp or Telegram or Facebook. Like those are things that aren't displayed publicly like on Twitter and can be harder to analyze. So th th those are dark social conversations that more and more communities often have. Uh, so it is equally important uh, for the online component as well as to, to look at the offline um, uh, world in terms of conversations. Um, and then finally, it's this notion of generating timely routine reports that can be used to inform public health action. When we're reflecting on this, we realize that in some ways, there's a lot of overlap with traditional public health surveillance. And this is a generic definition of public health surveillance, the ongoing systematic identification, collection, collation analysis, and interpretation of both disease occurrence and public health event data for the purposes of taking timely and robust action. Source, who IDSR technical guidelines. 2019. And the more that we talked about this, the more that we realized there's actually a good amount of overlap, right? I mean, if, if you create two columns and you put infodemic surveillance systems on one side and traditional on the other, and we think about some examples like, you know, the CDC SOVC, we, we, so we realized that there's actually some good traditional surveillance systems that have good out, um, yeah. overlap, right? So like outbreak media monitoring, um, Esther in the last talk talked about uh, monitoring media sources uh, to get a sense of outbreaks. This is uh, something that is done not just by uh, public health authorities, but also state and local health departments, sometimes even th through things like Yelp reviews, right, to, to get a sense of early de detection systems for, uh, for outbreaks. We also realized that the, um, the BRFSS, this is a long established behavioral risk factor surveillance system, um, you know, includes qualitative um, and certain and quantitative survey data that is frequently and regularly co collected from the community for the purposes of public health action. You might point out that there's a key difference here that, you know, infodemic surveillance systems detect ideas while traditional surveillance systems detect disease. And what I like to point out is that there's actually a good amount of overlap here as well, right? That both of these are really resting on an epidemiological model. And if you look at the system from the perspective of the idea, and you think about how ideas transmit from person to person or shared through groups, there's actually a good amount of similarities between the two. Um, uh, Liz Wilhelm, one of the uh, health community educators on the team pointed out that uh, there's a famous quote that meme is a linguistic virus. I also point out that from the social science tradition, there's a long tradition of thinking of ideas in this way, that the evolutionary behavioral sciences, gene culture, coevolutionary theory, think about ideas as ideational units that can be spread, where it's useful to actually think about ideas in a population from an epidemiological model, thinking about person, place, and time, and how they're spread. Other commonalities that we came up with is that these systems can be both active or passive. They could be event or indicator based because at the end of the day, they're really all systems that need to be designed based on both capacity as well as the individual needs. I want to shift from here to talk a little bit about the key considerations. So the, um, the first one that we thought about is the issues around case definition. So in traditional public health surveillance, we rely on metrics, uh, incidents, prevalence, prevalence, these more traditional quantitative metrics, usually, although Esther also pointed out the importance of understanding context. But in general, these systems are, are dependent on these quantitative metrics. For the infodemic world, we don't have established metrics that are, 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 are regularly used after decades of experience, right? The, the field is so nascent that all of this is requiring constant revision. Um, it's also worthwhile pointing out that quantitative metrics alone are not going to be useful, right? So if we look at a tweet together, this is a tweet from the WHO about how 5G moment networks do not spread COVID-19. And 824 retweets, 429 quote tweets, 1,845 likes. And you can look at on the bottom, the number of retweets, quote tweets, likes, 
right? But like looking at those numbers alone is not as useful without looking at the meaning of the post, right? The context in which the post was made during that time and the populations involved. So again, the subjective lens is really important here and that will complicate the creation of case definitions in a way that is rigorous and transferable across all domains. So it's really important to make sure that that's included in the design of individual case definitions. The second key consideration is timeliness. And we've talked about this a little already. But if I look at you know, a table of common viruses, the shortest incubation period for these viruses is just one or two days. You can argue there's some bacterial diseases that uh, might be even shorter than that. Source, Flint et al. Principles of Virology, 3rd edition, 2009. But in the infodemic world, information doesn't have an incubation period. Right, information spreads faster than the infectious diseases that we know about. So it is critically important for timeliness, right? It, it is critically important that, 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 that these systems can capture thoughts that are being spread with a click of a mouse or a phone call in a way that, um, that can be transferred into public health action quickly. The third uh, consideration is place. And again, we've talked about person, place, and time. Place is such a cornerstone for descriptive epi. But for infodemic surveillance systems, this becomes more of a challenge, right? Some online communities exist without a geographic limit, right? There's social media data that may or may not exist with geographic specificity, right? So um, thinking about tweets, right? Not all tweets are geocoded. Not, not, not all of the accessible data have location data that's acceptable to it. So this then creates a bit of a mismatch where if you are a state or local health authority and you're trying to design an intervention, but the data sources are now aggregating to a higher level, this creates a bit of conflict. So designers of infodemic surveillance systems have to figure out not just how to operationalize place for the purposes of infodemic surveillance, but also think about how do we actually link the findings to appropriate uh, avenues or opportunities for designing interventions or for public health action. The fourth is a little bit about, about personnel. And this is another diagram that came out uh, from W. A cartoon. Several blindfolded people stand around an elephant. Rachel, and I, and I love it because we often talk about how the infodemic space requires so many disciplines that it's kind of like people um, are touching the elephant from different perspectives with their own um, areas of blindness and their own areas of insight, right? So infodemic surveillance systems really require the social sciences, communication, social media, marketing, traditional public health. We have to combine all of those perspectives together in order to make these systems work. So from that, we have to think strategically about building human technical capacity for this, right? Like we, we need people who can, who can speak these languages, who have these expertise, who can work across disciplines, but also institutional capacity for this work, right? We, we need budgets and organizational units to accommodate the interdisciplinariness that is needed for this kind of work. Information systems is the next consideration. So what I'd like to highlight and um, for the informaticians, this is very obvious, but any kind of surveillance system requires establishing a data source, moving from that to data analysis, and then moving from that to getting the data to users in an actionable format. And this looks so simple, right? When I show people an SLVC report, it looks so simple on the surface. But the reality is that this requires coordination between units, formal partnerships, political will, and infrastructures to, to, to support all of that. So the it's not just a matter of flicking a switch and turning on a data source, but really thinking about the organizational context that that data system must exist in. And that's really important when we're starting up infodemic surveillance systems for the first time. And then uh, talking about integration and coordination. So one of the other things that we think is very important to highlight is that infodemic surveillance is a new activity, right? So likely we will need new units created on organizational charts to accommodate this level of work. In turn, uh, new relationships probably need to be formed between departments that were not uh, formed before to make sure that the data can actually be acted on. And then on top of that, there's likely a need for partnerships with external groups, with not just state and local uh, health departments, but also um, with industry, with social media companies, with technology companies to make sure that these systems are efficient. And I'm highlighting this and, and we are starting to hear some examples of this coming into play. 
uh, with incident management systems being stood up for monkeypox, for example, where we are hearing of specific infodemic management units that can do this kind of level of analysis and coordination work within the organizations. And then finally, I wanted to talk a little bit about legality, privacy, and ethics, because I think this is actually really important, right? That, um, you know, traditional public health surveillance, again, requires on, um, is, is really reliant on these more objective diagnostic criteria traditionally. And infodemic surveillance systems requires subjectivity, right? So this then raises some ethical questions, right? So for misinformation, who is the arbiter of truth of what counts as something as factually accurate? Right. And on top of that, sometimes what is factually accurate might change over time. And in that conversation, what is the role of the public health authority? Right. Is, is, is that is that a role that we are already taken on, that, that, that that's actually a role that we've traditionally done? Or are there other more creative systems that we can think of that might do this more efficiently or more effectively? I don't know. I'm just raising that um, as a concern, given the subjectivity within this space. The other thing to consider is the collection of data, right? That that with um, with private data or data that people perceive to be private opens up an additional ethical consideration. So for example, it is really easy to join social media groups that are open to the public for you to join, right? So um, individual people might participate as part of the groups. They may not make their own personal posts publicly available, but they may post in a group uh, in a publicly available fashion, right? So if you're a public health authority and you join that group, are there ethical considerations of analyzing that data if you are not explicitly presenting yourself as a member of the public health organization while you're in that group? So that's a very specific ex example, but again, this kind of work, even though we, we, we you know, obviously it's, it's really important to work to our ethical um, maximums as much as possible, there's additional ethical considerations that might be different than, than, uh, than typically found in traditional public health surveillance. These are seven key considerations um, that I've hopefully walked you through in terms of some things to think about when uh, designing infodemic surveillance systems from scratch, and again, drawing from the experiences of the state of vaccine confidence reporting system. And I'm really trying to highlight that there's really a lot of similarities here to traditional public health surveillance systems. I think it's easy to get distracted by these special considerations, right? But, um, but the similarities actually outweigh the, um, the differences. And I do wanna highlight that, uh, you know, Esther in the previous talk talked about um, these large global coordination mechanisms. One of these is the Joint External Evaluation Tool. And this is from 2005. A table. And you notice if you look at the right column, uh, it, it talks about dynamic listening and rumor management. And if you're a country using this, um, either in the SPAR or the JEE, you, you receive maximum points if you have a strong system for listening and rumor management on a permanent basis, which is integrated into the decision-making and response actions. So this is from 2005. The, the fundamental idea of infodemic surveillance systems is not new within public health. I think what's different now is that the information environment has changed. And we also have the tools and experience to do something about it to improve public health systems. So again, I, I think we're, we're at this point of an of a unusual opportunity here. I think where we can really create innovations and improve public health to better meet the needs of the people that we're serving. And we hope that these key considerations highlight some important things to think about because one of the key things I like to highlight is that in this information age, it is easier to both share information, but also to share pathogens right, the, the rate of both have increased. So it's now critically important that we think strategically about designing these systems so that they can be scientifically rigorous, ethically sound, so that we can deploy them for both epidemic and infodemic response. Thank you so much for your time. I do wanna highlight some key acknowledgements. I wanna highlight um, Dimitri Probuski, Elizabeth Wilhelm, Christopher Bogolai, Nito Abad, as well as uh, Anisha Verma and Michael Gazi, who have contributed key work, as well as um, a lot of the thoughts and conversations um, that we've had that have informed this talk and are also um, hopefully informing a manuscript around this. Um, in addition, I also want to highlight uh, the demand for immunization team. CDC demand for immunization team. Team lead. Behavioral scientist. Nita Sabad. 
Infodemic Management Health Communication Specialist Elizabeth Wilhelm Health Communication Specialist Jessica Cullies Vaccine Safety Demand Health Communication Specialist Muriel Cote UNICEF IAPRO Nurse Epidemiologist Michelle Dines Fellows Preventive Medicine Resident Howard Shiel Epidemiology Fellow Ryan Nessa Diagnostics, Interventions, Monitoring, and Evaluation Health Scientist Data Yee Health Scientist Shibani Kalarni. Uh, we really work very closely as a team and everyone he on here has really helped shape the thinking of this in this uh, one way or another. So uh, just again, thanks to all of you. Thanks again for the time and I'm happy to take questions. For more information, contact CDC. 1-800-CDC-INFO open brace 232-4636 close brace. TTY 1-888-232-6348 www.cdc.gov. The findings and conclusions in this report are those of the authors and do not necessarily represent the official position of the Careers for Disease Control and Prevention. Thank you so much, Howard, for an excellent presentation. Uh, we do have um, uh, questions that have come in, and I invite uh, the audience to continue to put questions into the question and answer box. Um, so I will start from the top. Um, could the speaker review the sources of these reports? So maybe I think you touched on this a little bit, but maybe a little bit more, unpack a little bit more about where the um, data comes from. Um, and then further ask, are they solicited via survey methodology or is this a data mining project in partnership with a search engine uh, such as Google? Returns to the slide with the data pull from social listening and media monitoring. Third-party reports, direct reports, research. Yeah, I'll, I'll go ahead and um, and put this diagram back up again. And again, if you Google uh, state of vaccine confidence inside reporting system, um, these th there's a great data table that um, that that walks you through these different data sources. And you'll notice on here it's it's a mixture of different categories, right? There is social listening and media monitoring, and, and these are direct analysis of, for example, things that people are saying online in, in sources. Um, looking at uh, search data, for example, Google Trends on the top right, but then also using these other kind of aggregate tools to get a sense as to what is um, what is being discussed. So, so these are typically uh, commercially available tools that were originally designed for social media marketing, things like Meltwater, Sprout Social. You also notice there's third party reports. So these are reports that are put together by other organizations that are often aggregates of these, but include a little bit um, of editorial content as well as some context uh, so that we're not the only ones who are pulling in uh, data directly. On the top right, again, direct reports in the CDC context, so looking at media requests, web metrics. CDC info is our public uh, inquiry system, so you can call in as well as email in uh, to those, and then we can uh, take a look at that to get a sense of what questions that people have, for example. And then on the bottom right, traditional research, right? So like both uh, research that is published in the white literature, as well as survey data that is collected by other organizations at the bottom. So hopefully this gives you a sense of the complexity of this work, as well as the, um, the, the, the multitude of data sources that are coming into the system. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Howard. And, uh, and I'm delighted to see the COVID-19 science update down there at the bottom right, which I was involved with several times while on the response. Uh, near and dear to my heart. Um, so one of the audience members uh, asked not a question, but a comment and, was, and said uh, they were excited to see this topic, very relevant, especially for those implementing grant supported vaccine hesitancy activities at the local level. Thank you. Yeah, I nice here because that was, yeah, go ahead. Absolutely, I, I totally share that, 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 that enthusiasm that that misinformation and disinformation infodemics really contribute to public health outcomes. One of the things that I want to warn people, though, is that it is really important to not make the assumption that the infodemic is the primary reason for low vaccine uptake. Right. So that is one of the key things that our team really emphasizes is the need to collect local information to inform that assessment. Right. We always highlight that that is a hypothesis that you have that requires confirmation. So tools like the rapid community assessments that um, that Esther highlighted in her talk. If you search for rapid community assessment, there is a whole toolkit that you can draw from that is designed for the rapid uh, qualitative data collection that state and local health departments as well as other organizations can use. 
And we frequently combine those with elements from human-centered design to take those findings and then, and then translate them into interventions for public health. So again, I, I share that enthusiasm that, that there's funding opportunities. We have to build up systems for this, um, you know, especially the infodemic surveillance systems. But on the flip side of this, it is important to maintain a degree of skepticism and really do some of that work to make sure that infodemics are really the key factor that is driving a vaccine uptake in your local situation. I think, thank you for raising. I think that's a great idea, a great point. I think especially as you raise the data you have are often at the national level and not not necessarily at the local level. And the other question, you know, the other thing that you, that your comment raised is that like all surveillance is the question of representativeness. You know, is the, is the information that's being picked up on social media or other places that representative of communities that someone might be working with at the local level? So I think that is a really, really great point. Um, okay. So um, someone, um, this is sort of a, a um, relates to, I think, one of the points you raised about where this work would sit, for example, at CDC. So what do you think should happen next as a result of infodemic and insights work? Where should this work sit within the agency? Of course, I'm sure this is your decision to make, I'm sure. Um, and um, do you have anything, is there anything like it in place, for example, on a center, at a center level? Um, now. I want to highlight again that these systems are new, right? So, so I think state of vaccine confidence is a great example, right? It's um, in, in, in terms of the experiences we have, I think now we have the ability to really think strategically about where this sort of thing might sit, right? And I think what I want to highlight again is the interdisciplinariness of this work. I think one of the really exciting things that, uh, that is being done by Chris Vogelai's team is that they are considering, um, and I think they have a few key examples now of, of extending this system into other, other, um, other topic areas as well beyond beyond just COVID vaccinations. So, so for me, I think there's there's strategic considerations here in terms of where to place these units so that one they have the sufficient expertise, but do they have the enough capacity to extend for the topics that might be of interest, right? So I think that, uh, like you've hinted, Bob, is way above my pay grade. But I do think that thinking about uh, what you need to staff these units, what those connections are, what the expertise that you need, you can then figure out the best places to set it within your organization so that it is at a level where it can draw from um, both the data sources and expertise it needs, but have uh, also have the ability to push forward the interventions and the data for action piece, the steps that come after the information that's found, right? Like those, those linkages have to exist. Yeah. So, I, so I think once you take those considerations into mind, it becomes easier to design the organization. But right now I don't have a standard model for this that's going to exist, uh, that that's going to work well for all organizations because the flip side of this question is that all organizations are different. So I, I, I do think um, this in some ways needs to be designed for the specific uh, public health authority or the specific organization that we're talking about. Thank you. Um, let's see. So um, this uh, next question we have touches a bit on what you were raising toward the end of your talk on issues of ethics. Um, so in terms of monitoring disinformation or misinformation from an organizational standpoint, how do social media managers uh, monitor misinformation through comments on posts? And I, I would assume that this is the social media managers, if let's for the sake of you know this talk, maybe think about the people who are monitoring infodemic. Um, how do uh, managers monitor misinformation through comments and posts while avoiding the perception of stifling free speech? Yeah, that's really important. And one of the things that I want to highlight, especially for those of you who might be listening from outside of public health, is that when we talk about public health surveillance, I, I always worry because people immediately think of, you know, a, a white van parked somewhere with someone with binoculars listening and with fancy gadgets. That is not what we mean when we say public health surveillance. When we say public health surveillance, we're talking about these systems for, de for detecting either diseases or events of public health significance early on. Like that is what we mean. So for these infodemic surveillance systems, I want to emphasize that we are not snooping on people, right? Like there is there is no spy component. The data sets that are coming in are publicly available data sets, right? They are data sets that might be proprietary that companies might be selling, right? But they are gleamed 
from legal sources that do not require any sort of spying, right? So I, I want to make that abundantly clear that in terms of the ethical considerations, it's it's really not around the analysis part, right? The for me, the, the ethical considerations are actually what comes after. And I think that goes back to that question of free speech, right? That like there is things to think about when when um, when we are deeming things mis and disinformation and when we are talking about what might be true versus not. And I think sometimes this will be more obvious to people, like to the, 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 the lines will be less gray, but there may be also situations that might have a little bit more of a gray tint to them. And I do think that it is really important to have processes that are transparent, right? Where, where things are scientifically rigorous and citable so that we are coming at this from a nature, from a stance of inquiry together, right? That we're, we're trying to sort through what is out there and what is being said and what is true and what is not, right? So I think I think the, the general communication principles that we have within public health still apply in this situation, right? Because again, we were, we're really hoping to work with communities. And again, we are not people who are turning folks off, right? Like that, 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 is, that is typically not the role of, 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 of public health authorities. So it's really important to make sure that our, our traditional principles and our traditional uh, senses of ethics are really translated over to this new space. Thank you. And, and my sense is that this is, this is a new area for me. My sense is that information is most likely being used to identify what information would be useful for people to know from a respected source. And then using that in, you know, using information gleaned from this type of data to then craft public health messages to get information to people that would be most helpful for their health. Exactly. And, I, and, and that's a great correctly. way of thinking about it is it's often just understanding what people's questions and concerns are. And, and I think even some, something discreet like ivermectin, right, the, the, the system was able to pick up in advance um, the, the, the notion of ivermectin as, as, as a treatment. And for me, you can frame that as, as disinformation being spread. But on the flip side of that, those are questions that people have about what are the best ways to treat COVID-19, right? So it really is a system that is meant to capture the concerns and questions that people have so that we can respond to those more effectively with the tools that we have. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let's see. So that is um, all of the questions that um, have come in. So I wanted to thank the audience for their excellent questions. Um, and I also want to thank today's excellent presenters. Uh, I learned a lot today. I thought both of your presentations were fantastic. I'm sure the audience learned a lot as well. Um, I also want to give a big thanks to people who um, I can see, but others cannot see who are behind the scenes, who've done a tremendous amount of work to support this Grand Rounds and, and others that you've maybe tuned into. Uh, Lillian Yang, Rich McCord, Gabrielle Collins, and Laverne Bates um, have put a tremendous amount of work into putting these excellent sessions together. Um, as a reminder, continuing education credits are available. So please consult uh, the Preventive Medicine Grand Rounds website for details. And I believe that a link to the Preventive Medicine Grand Rounds website, it has been put in the chat. So please look for that. Uh, the next Preventive Medicine Grand Rounds will be held on July 6th. So I will hope to see you then. And that closes today's session. Thank you all so much. <laughs>